Hello, my name is Wade Nimmer, and this is Rotary Serving Our Community. One of the often asked questions that I receive from Rotarians, actually, is what a district actually is. And so in this show, we're going to take a look at specifically District 5240, the district that I belong in. We're going to look at the structure of it, the history of it, and try and give you an understanding of how this structure actually fits in Rotary International itself. To start with, uh, every Rotarian, every member of Rotary International, the 1.2 million members, have to be a member of a club in order for them to actually be a part of Rotary International. And it's the club that actually carries the charter for Rotary International. Now these clubs are organized geographically um, in groups called districts. There are 535 districts around the world, and these districts then are broken up and become part of Rotary International. And so our district specific is the one that I'm going to focus in on because I think, as an example, this would be a good one for um, everybody to understand, especially those in my district, District 5240. To start with the first slide, we are going to take a look at the district itself. There are 72 clubs in this district, a total of 3,300 Rotarians. That number has fluctuated anywhere from 32 up to close to 4,000 at the peak times of what we had. It covers a, a district uh, of a total of four counties. Actually, there's a little sliver of it, as you see, it has a parentheses five on that. The fifth area is a small corner of the Los Angeles County area, or Agura. Currently, because it's in parentheses, Agura does not have any clubs there. So the district itself covers Santa Barbara, Ventura, Kern County, and San Luis Obispo, again, with that sliver of uh, Los Angeles. The next picture I'm going to show you actually shows a little bit of the history. The history of Rotary uh, District 5240 starts way back in January 1st of 1918, and that is when the chartering of the Santa Barbara Rotary Club was first chartered and became active. Again, January 1st, 2018, Rotary Club of uh, Santa Barbara was chartered at that time. It was followed closely by a second uh, club, and that is the Ventura Club, uh, May 1st, 1919. Uh, Ventura, Rotary Club of Ventura has been around for quite a while. The third club, interestingly enough, was Bakersfield. Rotary Club of Bakersfield chartered in May 1st, 1920. Now what's unique about the structure or the way the organization actually came about, even though Santa Barbara was the first club in the district and followed closely by Ventura, the lineage of this started in Los Angeles area and actually came in from the south. So it was Los Angeles that was part of the sponsoring group that uh, sponsored Santa Barbara. However, Bakersfield came in from the other direction. Their chartering came from the north, actually started in San Francisco, came down through um, Stockton and uh, Lodi. So uh, they came in from a different direction, meaning that our district actually came in and was chartered in by two different entities, one from the north, one from the south. The first uh, governor that was actually uh, selected by this district was Arthur Kreitz from Bakersfield, and you see the two behind it, meaning that that was the second district. So that two actually is a designation of a district. That was in 1930 and 31. David Reese was the second governor of the district. He was from Ventura. Again, you notice the two. He was a governor from 1931 to 1932. I put then another line, and this shows the district number delineation that we have come through. Um, district starting with number two, then 106, 185, 158, 159, and then it was in 1957 that we became known as District 524. And it wasn't until 1992 that we actually have what we have today, and that was uh, District 5240. So these numbers coincide more or less geographically and also in uh, the occurrence of when they occurred or were chartered in and created. The next uh, set of pictures I want to have talks about um, the five avenues of service. Uh, the five avenues being club service, community service, international service, vocational service, and youth service. And I'm going to start with each of these one at a time. The first slide has to do with club service. Um, I have this picture here showing you what club service actually is. It's about the members and membership. The unique uh, opportunity I've had to go around the district and visit all of these clubs is finding out that each and every club, all 72 clubs, are very unique in personality, in culture, the way they function, and what they do. So they are well fit for each of these communities that we are in, 
but I put club service there because part of the uniqueness and personalities of our district come from the uniqueness and personalities of the clubs themselves. And we'll take a look at some of these clubs as we get farther into the program. The next slide we talk about is community service. And community service has to do with the global or the community impacts. How each of these clubs are able to interact within a community uh, and create a bonding effect or that effort in order to make a community better. And this is what Rotary focuses in on under community service. More specific, what is a club going to do to impact the community, to assist the company, the community, to make it different, to make it better? And this is what Rotary takes a look at. And this is exactly what clubs are functioning for, is to make uh, better each and every one of those communities. I want to share with you one example of a community project, one that touched my heart. This was done in San Luis Obispo, and they invited me up to do what they called a shopping spree for children. And it was during the holiday seasons where they would bring in underprivileged children, uh, ages 6, 7 years old, up to 11, 12 years old, and we would do a shopping spree at one of the local department stores. Again, it was all sponsored by Rotary and assisted by the department store itself, which at that time was Cole's, uh, Cole's uh, department store. We went in there with the um, ability to use $2,000 in credits. And I worked with a nine-year-old child, a, a young boy, a young man who was actually going through one of the first times he ever had a chance to actually shop. And our directive was to make sure they had shoes, socks, pants, shirt, jacket, anything else that they would need, but at least one complete set of clothing that they could have. This child here was uh, living on the streets. He was uh, one of the ones that was, uh, was considered homeless. And so I worked with him, and we went through, we probably spent 40, 45 minutes going through the store, picking things out. Uh, he would try something on, wouldn't be quite right. He'd go back and he'd change the color, and he was bouncing back and forth, having a great time. Now, the parents weren't allowed to be in the store. They actually were in a different location having breakfast. And so this was our job. And this is why we wanted to work with the children. So they owned what they had. As I went through the checkout line, one of the unique things hit me. Um, I asked him, and he was looking in the basket at all of his clothes, and he pulled out his pair of socks. And I looked at him, and I go, well, do you want to go change those socks? Is it the wrong color? Do you want to have a different type, something warmer, something... Uh, an athletic or, you know, what, what is it that you, you want to do with those socks? And he looked at me, looked back at the socks, then he looked up at me again. And he said, you know, I've never owned a pair of these. And so that was a pretty touching instance. Again, San Luis Obispo in the city. Put community service forward because we never know where or when we could help somebody out. This nine-year-old child had lived in that city most of his life, uh, yet we never realized the needs, the shortfalls, and the shortcoming of society without looking directly into seeing the, those needs. So I wanted to share that with you. Our next slide has to do with international service. Now, international service is one of those unique things. Less than 10% of all Rotarians will ever have the opportunity to do an international project. Yet the impacts that Rotary International has had around the world is unprecedented. It's, it's amazing. It's phenomenal. Um, Rotary is the largest service, humanitarian service organization in the world and also the, the most prosperous and strongest. And that's why international service becomes important. And I want to share this with those of you watching because oftentimes you look at the community as being the number one need and you go, well, why would we want to go out internationally with, and dilute our efforts uh, when we could do so many impact within the community? Well, international service is one area where we could affect communities by improving international relations around the world. One of the initiatives we have is polio, uh, eliminating polio, but also right behind that is our initiative to create peace around the world. And this is one thing that Rotary has taken and focused on for quite a few years. Forty-nine of the original seated people from the first United Nations uh, summit were Rotarians, and Rotarians still continue to this day to have at least one permanent seat on the United Nations floor. So we have been involved with peace throughout. And how do you create peace? What is the magic to creating these, this peace? Well, what Rory decided and has seen, and we have seen this happen time and time again, the success of peace internationally is going to come from us working together, doing humanitarian projects, and putting down, putting aside all differences to make sure that each and every person in this world 
gets what they need, what they deserve, and what we can give them, our offering. This is the exchange. President Tanaka said it best uh, in his theme, um, in that that was peace through service, was a theme that he lived with in his year. Peace through service makes a lot of sense because it is service and helping others where we knock those barriers down and make that change because now only friends can help friends out. So that's where international service comes in big. One of the areas that this district, District 5240, has been instrumental in doing to create this effort is creating agreements, uh, sister city or sister district agreements with a number of sister districts. And one of those is Mexico, 4140 Central Mexico, which has 135 clubs, roughly 2,000 members. And we work back and forth. We exchange twice a year, not only uh, friendship exchanges, but also in doing grants. Grants that they sponsor in, the, in our area, in our district, 5240, and also grants that we sponsor down in their area, 4140 Mexico. We have two districts in Korea that we also have the same agreement with. Those districts are 3721 and 3722. Uh, in the southern portion of South, uh, South Korea, in the area more or less around uh, Ulsan and the Pusan area, which is near the coastal region of uh, southern Korea. And uh, they have been there for quite a while. I think we're approaching 20 years now of having this partnership agreement. And the exchanges has been, even with the cultural differences and with the language barriers we faced, we have been very cooperative in exchanging these projects, these friendships, and uh, the governor line in order to make sure that we continue this agreement and this arrangement and relationships. So we always have that part of it working in the world. There's a fourth group, and that is Brazil. Believe it or not, we have a sister district agreement with Brazil, District 4630. Um, however, that one is not as cooperative, and when I say that, we uh, don't spend a lot of time with it. It was kind of a one-year deal, and we hope to be able to reinitiate that and get back into that area to help them again. But that was done by one governor to another governor in a specific year. I want to now jump into vocational service because vocational service is one of those areas where um, in a district it's, it's hard to promote and one of the reasons for that is in Rotary it was understood that you don't promote your business but you promote your profession and because of the complexity of that statement people in the past go well no you can't promote your vocation because it's part of your business which is not the case. So vocational service has to do more with your vocation, your expertise, your training, your education, what you do in your lifetime and what you do for life that you could now bring to Rotary. And so that's the difference. It is your vocational skills, not your business. And so that's why vocation became a kind of a unseen part of what we in our district done. Fortunately, there's been a resurgence of the awareness of that and it has helped quite a bit. We have also taken a look at how we could recruit and bring in the, the next generation. And so uh, flipping next, we go into youth service. And in youth service, one of the things we found out from uh, our, one of our past shows with Rotor Actors is the fact that you know uh, youth service, they are the young people. They are the ones supposedly coming in to take our place in the workforce. Uh, they are the ones that we ideally bring in. We, we give them a sense of ethics a sense of values, a sense of uh, service uh, to help out the communities around the world. Yet what they're asking us for is a mentorship opportunity, an opportunity to help them because as they become established in the workforce, we who are retiring should be the ones helping them out and making sure that they get and take the place of who we are today. So 10 years from now, 15 years, whenever we decide to retire, we will have another Rotarian stepping into our shoes taking over with the same ethical standards and the same resources and credibility that we have had as we served Rotary itself. We have next a, a picture, and this is a, an older picture, a picture of our district. And as you can see it, it does cover the four uh, counties. We have Ventura County, Santa Barbara County, San Luis Obispo County, and Kern County. And you can see how broad and diverse this district really is. This is, a, again, one of the older ones, so I don't have all of the clubs listed in there, but um, the uniqueness of that area and the size of our district, you can see Taft, actually Taft, California, is the center of our district. And so <laughs> the uniqueness and the size spans of this district, uh, it stands for itself. 
Roughly, uh, it is about 200 miles across in either direction, north and south and east and west. We go everywhere from the Los Angeles County line up to Monterey County line and from the Pacific Ocean on the west all the way to Death Valley on the east side. And so that's how, how big we are. And we talk about not only cultural diversity, but geographic diversity. We go from the lowest point uh, in North America, Death Valley, right next to us within a stone's throw from our district is the highest point in the contiguous U.S., and that is Mount Whitney. So uh, again, very diverse. We go from deserts to the ocean. The uh, district itself is broken up into 12 different groups, and these groups make up the district itself. These 12 groups are geographic in location, starting with Group 1, which includes um, Ridgecrest, Indian Wells Valley, Tehachapi, and Kern River Valley. So those are four clubs that make up Group 1. Uh, there's roughly, I believe, around 100 to 150 members in that geographical area. The next group is Group 2, and that is the Bakersfield area exclusively. There are six clubs in Bakersfield in these clubs. By the way, Bakersfield, the Rotary Club of Bakersfield, the third club from our district, is also the largest club in, in all of the district itself with a close to 170 members. So um, Bakersfield, because uh, they're such a large area, those six clubs make up one specific group. The next group is Group 3. It's a little bit smaller. It's the outlying areas of Bakersfield. It includes Taft, Wasco, Shafter, and Delano. Now, Delano is the farthest uh, north club that we have in the San Joaquin Valley for our district. The fourth area, or fourth group, is Thousand Oaks and Westlake, which has two clubs, Conejo Valley and Newberry Park. And so that is Group 4, um, one of the more condensed, concentrated areas population-wise of our district is that specific area. Group three, I'm sorry, group five is Simi Valley, which has three clubs, and Moore Park, which has two clubs. And so uh, group five actually has, again, a pretty good size uh, cluster of Rotarians. Group six, group six is Camarillo, which has two clubs, and Oxnard, again, with two clubs there. So that makes up the group six area. It's basically just what, below the Conejo grade. Group seven, includes Ventura, which has three clubs, Ojai, which has two clubs, Fillmore, and Santa Paula. So that is group seven. That is uh, more or less kind of the central area of that. Uh, Carpinteria is in group eight. So group eight includes Carpinteria, which has three clubs, Montecito, Santa Barbara, which has three clubs, and Goleta, which has two clubs. One of the larger areas that we have uh, as far as population-wise of Rotarians, there are approximately 400 Rotarians in this area here. Group 9 is uh, San Ynez, Solvang, Los Olivos, Buellton, Vandenberg Village, and Lompoc. Those, uh, those clubs make up Group 9 specific. If you notice, that's more or less in the San Ynez Valley area, kind of a band between Santa Barbara and Santa Maria. Now we jump up to Group 10, which is San Luis Obispo in that area. So San Luis Obispo, which has four clubs, it's Pismo Beach, Grover Beach, Arroyo Grande, five cities, um, make up that specific area. And so that is a San Luis Obispo area. Now, taking a note that we have passed over Santa Maria, and I'll get back to that. Group 11 is Paso Robles, which has two clubs, Templeton, Cambria, Cayucas, Los Olivos, and Morro Bay. Again, Morro Bay has two clubs there. So this is the largest area or group that has, uh, with well, the most number of clubs. And that is the farthest north that we go, uh, Paso Robles, inland, and uh, Cambria uh, along the coast. Now we jump back to group 12. When I say jump back, we're going to go back to the Santa Maria area. Santa Maria has three clubs there and, uh, in Santa Maria and one other club, Nipomo, which makes up group 12. And the reason that group 12 is kind of isolated out or had to be, uh, I would say, re-included was the fact that originally Santa Maria area fit in more with San Luis. It was bounced between San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara. And so the reason that it came in later was the reason why it became number 12 as opposed to being in sequentially, uh, sequential order being 10, 11, and then 12. So that is why Santa Maria area has uh, the number 12 group de designation. Now what else is interesting about these 12 geographical regions and the 12 groups is that each of these groups is 
watched over or be the resource for that group is an assistant governor. An assistant governor that serves under the governor, again, serves a one-year term. These assistant governors are the direct link between the clubs and the governorship or the district leadership itself. Also, these assistant governors serve as on the selection committee. Each one of those 12 will serve on a selection committee annually for selecting the upcoming district governors. And so that is one of the parts of the structure that works out well. Along with the 12 assistant governors on that selection committee, there are two immediate past governors, the most immediate past. So the most immediate past two governors become 14 of that selection committee. The most senior of the group will be the one that will serve as a chair without a vote, making it now 13 voting delegates for selection of a district governor. That selection occurs usually in the fall, around uh, October time, and we will be selecting four years in advance. That would be called the district governor designate. And so that's a four-year process of them coming into terms on that. One of the other points that I'd like to make is that it's the responsibility of the district. And the reason why the district even exists is that this district becomes a resource to assist the clubs in attaining their goals. And so even though we have a district, quote, leadership, it is actually the club's responsibility to lead themselves, but it is the district that would be used for them as a resource. So if there's something that they have short of, then it is up to the district to make sure that those needs are met. Along with that, we also have district assemblies, training assemblies, which we are in right now. It's in the springtime. And we have what's called the district conference. The district conference occurs once a year, and it rotates around the area. The selection of this location is based on a selection by the district governor of that given year. Averages between 300 uh, to 350 attendees to that. And believe it or not, I'm going to let you know this right now. Your club dues goes, $5 of your club dues goes to a district conference. A dollar of your dues goes to a district training assembly. That's why assemblies come free, and that's why district conferences are something important for you to go to because you are already investing in that. So the next picture I have shows kind of a, a more modern image of our district. And I put this one up there specific because if you look at the geographical area and region, you'll note that 80%. 80% of the total number of Rotarians in our district are actually along the coast, and that's where the concentration is, and that's why we are so diverse along the coast side. The next picture we have uh, shows actually uh, a, picture, a picture of the diversity of it. And I put this picture up there and these pictures up because it's very important to realize that not only are we geographically uh, diverse, but we are also culturally diverse. And one of the reasons is specifically because of the geographics. If you look at what happens along the coast, along what's happening uh, along in the desert, you'll, you'll see there's quite a few different things. Our natural resources are all focused more or less in different areas. We have um, tourism along the coast. We have agriculture on the inland areas. And uh, again, uh, we have a whole lot of different things happening in each of these different regions where these clubs exist. The next point I'd like to bring up is our board of directors because uh, a lot of times people realize, well, who makes the decisions? Well, it's actually the Rotarians, you guys, that make the decisions, but it is the board of directors that make sure that everything stays up. This list shows um, our current board of directors is John Weiss from Morro Bay. He is our sitting governor. Following him will be uh, Sandy Schwartz from Bakersfield East. She is uh, governor-elect. After her will be Savi Bim. Uh, Simi Sunrise, she, was, she is a governor nominee. Um, the immediate past governor, Nick Frankel from Westlake Village Sunrise, serves on the fourth seat. And the fifth seat is a member at large selected by the governor. Um, this year it is Deb Linden from uh, San Luis Obispo. By the way, uh, Deb Linden, congratulations to her, has been selected to be the district governor designate. So she will now jump into this line. This was established in 2013. Before that time, the governor, Bernie Mitch, had executive rights. I was the last governor with those rights. Um, back then, the board of directors was the governor and the, the district secretary. The district secretary, by the way, had no vote. So it was up to the governor to make any kind of decisions they want. Uh, pretty much had executive rights overall on any changes 
and decision-making body that the uh, organization had. By the way, we are a corporation. Next picture shows the pictures of them. Uh, we have all the pictures surrounding them. This is your board of directors right there with John Weiss in the center. Uh, we have Nick. Uh, below him is Savi Bim. Uh, you have Sandy Schwartz and Deb Linden. So that makes up our district uh, board of directors. The next picture I have shows how um, the district fits into a larger picture. And this is a zone picture. There are 70, I'm sorry, 34 zones around the world, 17 directors. And our district fits in one of those specific zones. So that's the next breakdown of how the structure goes above and beyond us. The zone itself has a zone director, and they become the direct link between the Rotary International and the governors of our district in order to bring information down to us and also to maintain the um, organization uh, or corporation of Rotary International itself. Now, in the Corporation of Rotary International, we have one voting delegate, and that is the governor. So the governor is the one with exclusive rights. He represents us at the international level. We also have a district charitable foundation. Most of you are not aware of that. Now, that was started out with the idea to assist those clubs that did not have a club charitable foundation, or 501c3. So um, our district actually has one of these. Uh, there's a roughly $40,000 in, in the uh, foundation itself, so there's not really a lot of endowments uh, available to that. However, funding does occur on a regular occasion. The grants that you see uh, in front of you, district grants, Rotary grants, things like that, actually are grants that do not fit under the Rotary Foundation grants grant model. So that's why we offer these to you. The next picture, the last picture, um, shows a picture of some of the uh, unique opportunities that Rotary gives to us. And these are brought to us, started initiated by clubs, but then followed through by the district. We have international projects occurring. We have uh, a community event. That's uh, the Tamal Interpretive Play Area in Carpinteria, where the Rotary Club of Carpinteria Morning actually built, uh, with the assistance of a community, a million dollar park. And in the bottom is a Centennial Project, Arroyo Grande, their bandstand. I wanted to give you this information because one thing uh, that we often miss is what the district actually does, what it stands for, what it represents. And I hope this gives you a better understanding of why we are members of District 5240 and how the clubs themselves fit within this structure and how you as Rotarians fit overall with that. And with that, thank you very much. Take a look at the structure and I hope you enjoyed the show. We will see you next time.